Welcome to Still Growing in Grace, a weekly program dedicated to inspiring joy, giving hope, and delighting in grace. This program is brought to you by Hope Fellowship, your community church, and Growing in Grace Ministries Canada. I'm Pastor Michael Zenker, and for the next half hour, I'll be sharing with you a message of hope that will help expand your understanding of God's love and amazing grace. So many are tired of trying harder to live the Christian life. I've got great news for you. You can stop trying. God already deeply loves you, totally accepts you, and really, really likes you. Enjoy today's program as we dig deeper into what it means to still be growing in grace. Welcome to Still Growing in Grace. I am thrilled that you tuned in again. We have three really important announcements to share with you today. First, Still Growing in Grace is moving from our local radio Faith FM to online YouTube and podcast channels. You need to visit growingingrace.ca for the links to the podcast, the YouTube, and the Facebook link. Still Growing in Grace will continue each week, especially for those who only view or listen online. Yes, it's continuing. The online feedback has been such an encouragement. Number two, we'd like to invite you to join us in person or via live stream for a special conference coming up January 18th. The event is called Grace and Grieving, Finding Hope in the Pain. Best-selling author of The Shack, William Paul Young, will be our guest that evening. You won't want to miss this one, but you must register for this event if you want to attend in person or if you want to watch the live stream. Again, visit growingingrace.ca for the links. Thirdly, if you've enjoyed this program over the last year, and yes, it's been one year of running this, uh, it's, it's incredible to believe that. Would you consider making a donation uh, to help us keep spreading this good news? We're only able to put on this program and put it together with the generosity of those who are encouraged by what they hear. Make your donation at growinggrace.ca and just look down at the bottom, you see the donation link. Now, enjoy part one of a two-part interview with Paul Young as we discuss some of the things that will be shared at the January 18th conference. Welcome, Paul Young. I'm so glad you're part of this show today. Um, Honored to be a part of it. Thank, thank you. you. For those that are listening on local radio or podcast, uh, this is a video interview ahead of time for an event coming up uh, in January, January 18th. It's an event called Grace and Grieving, Finding Hope in the Pain. And I'm going to be chatting with Paul Young for two, at least 45 minute sessions, just chatting through the really tough questions. And so I want to, I want I want you to meet Paul ahead of time. Um, I want to even look at his background a touch here because the shack is kind of a big book, which drew all of our attention. And uh, I want to see how we can bridge some hope to people that need it. So, Paul, thank you. This is uh, really, really honored, cool. Honored to be here. So, yep. and Paul, like you mentioned, you know, everybody experiences two things in common, um, loss and, and love. Yeah. It's, in, it's inside that mix of loss and love that that our lives are, are being discovered, expressed, experienced. And, um, and so the idea of grace and grieving hmm. is about love and loss. Yeah. 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 So I'm going to cheat. Let me give you an easy question. Um, the book, The Shack. Uh, maybe you could give it, some people may not know the story because you were here in 2013. I can't believe it was that long ago, right. um, but you shared your story, uh, the story behind the shack. Uh, and we're catapulting or piggybacking that for this event because the book deals with a lot of stuff to give us a quick summary of what led you to the book and what you've, uh, some of the results of the book that you've heard around the world. Oh my gosh. So I know. easy, easy question that could take hours, right? Right. Um, what led up to the book was just getting to a place in my life where I finally felt like I was healthy. And that was the year I turned 50. So it's not like it was just an overnight sort of thing. I'm a missionary kid, preacher's kid. So I'm steeped in modern evangelical fundamentalism. And yep. um, that's, that's the world I grew up in. And I'm a firstborn on top of it. So oh my goodness. Yeah. I, I, I had all sorts of religious expectations. Well, I'm 51 now. So I, it's like when I, when the age I'm at now is when you began this. Well, I, I, the real, I began it from a child, you know, because sure. I, I think the process in our lives is it wraps itself inside the world that we grow up in. And, and our experiences are never left behind. 
they are then worked into the sound that we become. So I can, I can look back at my life and say, I can track it all the way back to my childhood and say there are certain things that I experienced as a child, which were incredibly wonderful and other things that were incredibly destructive. Mm. You know, um, child abuse started for me in a culture that is not, uh, it's not my passport culture. It's culture I grew up in overseas, but the, the child abuse began inside of that culture before I was five years old. So, wow, that's amazing. Oh, it's terrible. And, um, and there's nothing quite like child abuse, as far as I know. There's nothing quite like child abuse that will tear up the, the fabric of the human soul. So, so uh, again, growing up in a multicultural world was an incredibly wonderful thing. Growing up with a very angry father who didn't have a chip for being a dad was a very mm. terrible thing. The sexual abuse was a terrible thing. Uh, being sent away to boarding school at six and having big boys come at night and molest the little boys, that was not a, a, a good experience. But I thought you were on missions trip. It should have been extra safe. Uh, yeah, right. No, I was part of a generation. I'm old enough to, to say that you know there was a generation of us – and not just one. There were a number of generations of us that were basically sacrificed on the altar of mission. And there was a sense that if you were doing the work of God, you would be like Abraham who was willing to sacrifice his son on the altar. You know, that, that would be the real test, whether you could, you could put your own children at risk. And, 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 that, and that's not an accusation. You know, my parents were trying to do the best that they knew how. Mm -hmm. inside of a frame of reference of a religious conviction that um, that I think originated in compassion in a sense, you know, uh, because there's a longing in us to to actually do something in the world that matters, that that expresses truth and goodness and reality. But it comes packaged in our own experience. And so it's layered with all the damage we've had, with all the sense of abandonment or you know we have um we have 12 grandchildren right now well um, and they're all 12 years old and under and and one of them is adopted from uganda who and she was a basically a throwaway child in a, mm. in a world where she wasn't wanted and and you know she's now in second grade and but we're going to have to deal with some things because it, it comes with that experience. There was a time where she basically lived on weak, weak tea and white bread. I mean, that, that was her sustenance growing up. And so, you know, there are some, there are some things that are going to have to uh, be exposed and come to the surface because of the losses in her life. And, and, and love doesn't just make those things go away. You know, actually, love creates an environment where those things can be exposed and healing can happen. It's, that sounds so opposite to what we grew up with, because the Western world thinks it's it, you got to be passive then. You know, if you're going to be loving, that means passive and no, conf no confrontation. Yeah, right. right. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, um, <clears throat> I, was, <clears throat> I was with Richard Rohr, who is a Franciscan. Oh, priest. my goodness. He's amazing. <clears throat> he is amazing. And... Uh, <clears throat> And I did a conference with him on the Trinity. And uh, so we, we were driving along and he says, he says to me, so he says, Paul, this may sound really strange coming from a celibate Franciscan priest. But he said, I think the greatest gift that God ever gave the human race is marriage. He wow. said, because it puts you into proximity with someone where you can't hide your crap the way that you, you did. You know, and a lot of us go into marriage thinking we're a certain kind of person, but but the friction of exposure to relationship causes our crap to come to the surface mm -hmm. in one form or another. Mine did, you know, and, and part of the reason it took 50 years for me to heal is because I kept everything hidden, you know, because that's the way we grew up, right? Is well, don't, don't we also start our relationships dating only showing the best? There's no way we're going to show our crap. We're only going to show the best part so we can woo the other person, hook them into the ring, say the I do, and then, and then what? 
Yeah, like, and I don't, and I think most of that's subconscious. I don't think it's yeah, a conscious. Attempt. I agree, totally yeah. agree. Yeah, so it's not like we've devised a plan to get past Correct. somebody's crap detector. You know, yeah. it's that we are all trying to survive, mm -hmm. and that's that's the that's a commonality in terms of loss is that we all become survivalists. That is, we develop certain skill sets in order to have a sense of being safe. For example, lying. Lying, everybody, they don't like lying, they are against lying, and yet most people employ that survival mechanism in one sense or another. Or you don't, you don't tell the real truth because of the, you don't tell the whole truth, you know, because of the um, repercussions or the consequences. And so you learn, you learn to guard yourself, you know, mm. for, for me, my dad was an abusive disciplinarian and, and lying, lying became a survival skill to try to get out of the beatings, you know, and, um, that and begging, you know, mm. so, so, you know, over time, um, lying worked some of the time. And so it became part of the arsenal of survivalism. And then I drug that into my other relationships where I didn't want to deal with the emotional repercussions of a particular conversation. And, you know, and it happened. Thank God I'm, I'm married to um, an incredibly powerful and strong woman who, who, um, who wouldn't allow me to just stay hidden. Wow. I, I, she's all about exposure. And, it, and I think exposure is a good thing. Um, I actually think it's necessary for the healing to actually happen. I think the unexposed is the unhealed. So it's like an honesty that's forced. Like instead of uh, protecting the lies, uh, the exposure means I'm exposing who I really am. Do you still love me? Yeah. Um, yeah. You, oftentimes there are, there are a lot of us who are so broken that it's not like we're going to volunteer that kind of exposure. <laughs> I agree. We have to actually get caught <laughs> and, um, you know, we get caught in our lies or we caught, you know, we build a little house of cards, a, a persona that we've created in order to survive. And at some point, and, and, and I think, I think God has absolutely the intention of destroying anything that is in us that is not of love's kind, which would include every part of what we fabricated as a survival persona, an avatar. And um, there's this great passage, which I love, which gives my people all kinds of fits. And that's the one where Jesus says, you know, many will say to me on that day, I did miracles in your name and I healed the sick and I, I preached the gospel and I did all these good religious things, you know. And Jesus, will, Jesus says, and I will say to them, depart from me into everlasting destruction because I don't even know you. Right? Uh, that'll mess up people's heads. Well, it's one of those passages that you just kind of skim over. And, yep. uh, you know, because it just, it's like, really? And, and when we hear the words everlasting destruction, we think hell, you know. Yeah. And, um, but that's just, we're so hell conscious as my people are anyway. We've, we've got a bigger relationship to hell than we ever had to Jesus. Yeah. And um, so uh, what's that passage actually saying? It's saying, you've confused your performance with your identity, and I don't build a relationship with an avatar. I, I refused to treat the person you really are as the person you present to me. Wow, that's beautiful. Right? Yeah. So I, I want that avatar absolutely and completely destroyed. Why? So that you and I have a possibility of a relationship that love can actually happen because as long as you're performing your sense of identity, I don't even know who you are. You're not telling me who you are. You're not being a truth teller. There's no basis for relationship. So is the, is the shack then a, a story of you walking through how to arrive at that awareness? Yeah, a lot of it is. Yes. So I um, had a woman from Nashville who's a writer, Leanne Stewart. She says to me, she wrote me an email when the book first came out and she said, I have no idea who you are. I don't know anything about you, but my sense is that Missy, who is the main character's daughter, who's abducted and presumed to be murdered, that Missy represents something murdered in you as a child. Wow. 
and Mackenzie is you as the adult trying to deal with it. And I, and I tell people all the time that, that Mackenzie's weekend in the shack, which is the centerpiece for the story, that that weekend represents an 11 year dismantling and rebuilding journey for me. And, um, I would love extreme soul makeover. You know, I'd love instant transformation. Give me a red or blue pill, but we're too incredibly crafted for quick fixes, mm -hmm. you know, and, and if, if love, if God is love and, and, and real love does not force transformation, you know, it is present with you. It confronts you, right? Because yeah. that's part of exposure but it is not willing to stand idly by while anything that is not of love's kind remains. So there is a fiery process. I, I love the statement that religious people believe in hell, but spiritual people have been there. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. yeah I've heard that. That's awesome. It is. And I think it's, it's very true that everybody gets salted with fire, you know, which means that fire is a restorative thing. It's to burn away everything in us that is not of love's kind. And, and that is a journey that all of us are on. And mm -hmm. human relationships put us into those kinds of uh, environments in which transformation can actually happen. So does loss, by the way. There is something really clarifying about loss. I have a bunch of friends on death row in Tennessee, in Nashville, in Unit 2 of Riverbend uh, Penitentiary. And, and these guys have become my friends over the last few years. And... Um, and uh, I was talking to Terry, one, one of my friends there, in, who I know the best of all the guys there. And, um, and, I was, and we were talking about, I said, Terry, you know, your prison is obvious. You know, it's brick and steel and gravel and wire. And, um, and there's really a great clarity to your mm. prison, right? Wow, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know where you're going. <laughs> yeah. Well, so many of us out there, outside of these walls, have no clarity about the prisons that we live inside. In fact, yeah. we have so got accustomed to the prisons of our lives that we have called them home. And, um, and so what, what I may see as a prison in a person's life, they may call home. So I need to be very careful not to pull them through the bars of their own prison for their own sake. Mm -hmm. Not my job. No, but some, some religious people want to. They use the, they have a little tiny sliver of awesome good news, and then they use it as a fire hydrant on people instead of a reverse osmosis tap. You know, like, don't overdo it. Be loving and gentle. Don't overdo this little nugget you have, because that's even a limited nugget. Even you think, you think you know the world, but no. Yeah. That's what I, think, I think your book has done that for me. It has thank you. woken me up to slivers of questions, or making me address questions, or at least... Um, be aware there are questions I had, you put words to them, and now i got to process them. It's like, wait a minute, somebody actually said that? I've been thinking that the whole time, but now I don't know how to walk through it. And then your book does. Yeah, so, <laughs> you know, like I said, extreme soul makeover would be much easier than actual process, the process of transformation. Yeah. And, um, and so uh, going back to something you had said earlier about about creating a persona in order to win the love and the affection of someone, you know, <laughs> yep. like the dating thing. Mm -hmm. and, and, and here's the difference between real love and infatuation, because infatuation is what the Greek would call eros, which is not a term that's used in scripture, by the way. <laughs> and um, it, was a, it was considered an absolute uh, diabolical um, um, not, not even a reality. It was considered such a delusion that it, it, it carried a demonic name associated. Wow. With it. Yeah. I've only heard the softened version that it's self-seeking, self-centered. <laughs> That's yeah. a dumbed or, down or, or, or that it's um, erotic and therefore the sexual part of love or the, you know, the well, romantic that gives, part. Right? But that messes up the, the physical, sexual, uh, healthy perspectives on it. If you associate that with that. Correct. But that's what has been done in our culture and also within some of our religious Christianity, too. We've, we've created eros as one of the kinds of love that has some sense of legitimacy, whereas I don't think it's legitimate at all. Our, I think our equivalent would be infatuation. And infatuation mm -hmm. is where you are pulled out of your senses based on what? 
based on projecting your own needs through an object. It's relational porn is what it is. It's pornography of relationship where, where it's not just an image on a, on a screen or an image in a magazine or something. This is a three-dimensional image through which you are trying to love yourself. And, and infatuation is based on not knowing. And that's the point I'm trying to get to, is mm -hmm. that real love is always based on knowing. Therefore, that which keeps you from being known has to be exposed and destroyed, right? Which would be all the survival skills and all this. And, and a lot of that we have so incorporated into our existence. That's why I say we... We call our prison home, you know, <laughs> that it's what we know. And uh, it reminds me of so many times where Jesus would say to someone who was a paralytic or, or blind, they, he'd say, so what do you want? And it's like, isn't it obvious? Well, no, it's not obvious. Yeah. Because, you know, a lot of us, you know, some event that hurt us in our childhood, we cannot let go of it. And therefore, we now call it home. We call that, we don't know how to present our sense of identity apart from that loss. I, I just had a thought, and I, confirm with me on this, if it's true, because I think it's true. Um, I know you've gone through sexual abuse. Uh, we've shared our story, or I've shared mine with you. I too have gone through um, sexual abuse from a Roman Catholic priest and a very abusive mother. But it wasn't until I was like 45 years old that some triggers woke up and I'm finding more and more men especially that aren't able to even talk about or something's going on in them at later age in life, not when they're younger or when they're getting married, but have you found a lot of um, more mature men are suddenly now waking up to, I got to deal, what is going on? Something's waking yeah. up and I don't know what to do about it. Does that yeah. ring a bell to you? Absolutely. And there's, there's no question about it. A lot of times you have the... Um, psychological resources to just bury stuff. And, and, and you, what you do is you turn outward, you turn into work alcoholism or mm -hmm. alcoholism or some kind of addiction, you know, mm -hmm. mission work for God or creating a ministry or, I mean, you can put it into any category you want. And Ouch. well, it's, it's the truth. That's what we do, yeah. right? Yeah. Rather than, mm -hmm. rather than do the internal work is where the real work is done. Um, we then make our job to do the external work and everything becomes performance and presentation. And that's the avatar that Jesus wants to destroy. Wow. Right? And so mm -hmm. we then create an identity based on our performance. And in the religious community, it would be like, you know, having a religious title or having a religious mission or all of that. But, but what happens is that suddenly... You know, you've, you've managed to survive until you're an older man. And one, your internal resources aren't as capable. Uh, the focus is no longer so much on the outside, especially if you've got kids and grandkids. Mm -hmm. You know, grandchildren will change you in a way that your children weren't capable of doing. And, I have uh, no idea. Yeah, no, <laughs> trust me. It's, uh, it's the truth. And, but, but again, it's like all of a sudden there's more space and into that space comes all these conversations you've never had and yeah. all these elements of exposure that you've never allowed. You know, uh, the secrets will find their way to the surface at some point. And we are getting, they're getting purged, right? It's like the fire of gold, yeah. whatever is purging all the stuff that shouldn't be there out. Yeah. And, and that heat is necessary in order to melt so that the crap comes to the surface. I don't like southern heat that's in like the tropics and stuff in the Caribbean. I don't like the emotional heat. That's hard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it is devastating. And it's not just yeah. hard. It is, it is cataclysmic sometimes. And, and that's what a lot of us, I mean, we've just piled the, the locker full of crap, you know, and then keep trying to keep the door shut. And it's <laughs> poisons leak out and begin to devastate our relationships. You know, unforgiveness is like that. Oh, my. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Unforgiveness is, is like wearing a corpse. 
you know. And, I and just I'm just finishing on this uh, still growing grace uh, radio program, a series on uh, healing life's hurts through understanding forgiveness. And it's about a 15 week uh, series. And the one that just aired today was uh, on the last myth of what forgiveness is not. Uh, and it happens to be uh, forgiveness is not as in not the same thing as reconciliation. And I think it's one of the greatest hindrances preventing people from forgiving someone because they're they've been told well that means i have to automatically go in connection um but I'm, I'm, before you respond um we're coming to the end of this half of the program okay. and uh we're going to continue the second half in just a moment um but i want to give you the heads up and i want to continue this conversation and talk about the conference coming up on january 18th uh, so let's uh let's bring this uh half to an end and uh, we'll be right back with the rest of the story. Thank you for taking time to watch or listen to Still Growing Grace today. Let me remind you of the three important announcements that we shared at the beginning of the program. First, Still Growing Grace is moving from local radio, Faith FM, to only online with YouTube and pod podcast channels. Visit growingingrace.ca for the links to the podcasts, to YouTube or the Facebook link. Still Growing Grace will continue each week as it has for the last year. Uh, those who listen online, yes, it's, we're going to keep going. The online feedback has been such an encouragement. Number two, we have a really important event coming up, and we'd like to invite you to join us in person or register for live stream. For a conference coming up January 18th, the event is called Grace and Grieving, Finding Hope in the Pain. Best-selling author of The Shack, William Paul Young, will be our special guest. You won't want to miss this event. You must register for this event if you want to attend in person or if you want to watch the live stream. The link is at growingingrace.ca. And thirdly, we're wondering if you have enjoyed this program over the last year. Yep, it's been a whole year. Would you consider making a donation to help us keep going, to keep spreading this good news? We're only able to do this with the generous donations of those who are encouraged by what they hear. You can go to growinggrace.ca, scroll down to the bottom, and click the donate button. Very easy to do. Join us next week for part two of Paul's interview um, as we discuss the things that will be shared in that conference. So until then, looking forward to uh, seeing you then. Thanks. You've been listening to Still Growing in Grace. I'm Pastor Mike Zenker. Join me next Tuesday at 1130 a.m. You can also watch these messages on YouTube or download our podcast at growingingrace.ca. Do you live locally? Visit hopefellowshipycc.com to find our service times and location. If this show has been an encouragement to you, Consider making a donation today at growingingrace.ca and help us keep spreading this good news. Thank you again for tuning into Still Growing in Grace.